uh, was familiar with the church that he was writing the email to, but I'm not familiar with the preacher. He made a remark, and this, of course, was yesterday, and it did me good to read it to, and to note what he said, and I thought I'd just take just a moment and quote to you the paragraph that he gave. My thoughts, prayers, supplications are especially for you all tomorrow, which would be today. Let come what may, we are resolved to keep marching onward to Zion. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus and his righteousness. And I appreciate that. It made me to uh, think I believe in the right direction, and I believe all of us as Christians. Uh, need to think. And so I just wanted to share that with you before we got into our study this evening. Again, thankful for your presence. Tonight we're looking at Lesson 2 in our series of studying Old Testament characters, looking at what we can find concerning them that either we need to imitate or that we need not to imitate. For the very simple reason that we know from Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, that the things that are written aforetime or before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. There's much to be learned, and that's why we still yet have accessibility to the Old Testament. It's there for our reading, for our learning, and to apply in our lives the example to see the character of God that we talked about in our study Sunday morning, and to see how that God has dealt with the human race all down through the ages. Characteristics that though God's law changes, the characteristics of God do not change, especially in regards to our relationship with him and in respects to whatever law that it is that we live under. And of course, we know that you and I today live under the law of Christ that we find in the New Testament. So tonight we're looking at Cain and Abel. And the story of Cain and Abel is found in the 17 verses in Genesis chapter 4. I want us to, since there's not that many, to just look at them. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time, his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the first fruits of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desires for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that everyone who finds, or anyone who finds me, will kill me. There I go, pushing the wrong buttons. Either my fingers are getting bigger or this button is getting smaller. <laughs> and the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. 
And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod in the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore him that. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son. Amen. So here are the 17 verses that contain the story of the characters that we're wanting to look at in our study this evening. And yet, in these 17 verses, the lives of Cain and Abel teaches us important lessons about ourselves and about our spiritual lives. And that's what we hope to gain from our study this evening. It was in Genesis 3 that we talked about last Wednesday night that we have and saw the root of sin. It's in Genesis 4 that we're studying tonight that we see the fruit of sin. The root of sin is unbelief, disobedience to God. Remember in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, Brother Donnie, read that for us. God said, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And we know that the serpent talked Eve into doubting God. And we know that the result of her unbelief was her disobedience to the very thing that God commanded them in regards to. We know from what we're seeing here, this not only last Wednesday night that we read about the first man and woman or the first husband and wife. Now we're seeing here in our story of Cain and Abel, the first children. And now Cain and Abel being the children, Adam and Eve being the parents. And we know that children learn from their parents. Abel learned about what sacrifices made to God and how to worship. And we know that Cain learned the lessons, obviously, of unbelief and of disobedience. And sort of thinking out loud here, we might well imagine which boy learned from which parent. Perhaps, and I want it understood, this is a big perhaps. Perhaps Eve expected Cain, which was her first son, to be the fulfillment of God's promise in Genesis 3 and verse 15. You remember that promise that God said that the, the seed of woman would bruise the head of the serpent while the serpent would bruise the heel of the woman, the seed of woman? So perhaps, maybe you expected Cain to be the fulfillment of Genesis 3, 15. And again, another been perhaps, perhaps he was coddled because of that, that assumption that maybe Eve made, you know, again, who knows? We're not saying this is for sure. But we know that Cain was not the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, by no means. In fact, he was far from being a savior. He was a murderer. And to pay particular note, you know, we cannot determine how God will carry out his promises. Genesis 3.15 was a promise. We talk about it. We teach on it. We reflect upon it a lot to be one of the first hints, one of the first prophecies that's made concerning the coming of the Redeemer, the coming of the Messiah. So yes, it is a promise of God, and we simply cannot determine how that God will carry out his promises, but the truth of the matter is, he doesn't need any help. And I think we're going to see that very clearly when we study the case of Abraham and Sarah 
especially Sarah, in regards to the promise of a son that gets the handmaid mixed up in trying to help God in the fulfillment of the promise that he would give unto them a son. So no, God doesn't need any help in the fulfilling of anything that he promises. We see, too, the fruit of apostasy. By apostasy, we mean falling away from God. To apostatize is simply that which we can see Cain did by the manner in which he worship, or rather, more truth to the matter, he failed to worship. And of course, the subsequent murder that he committed as a result of it. So, the first lesson that we can learn is that God expects obedience. Cain, we know, brought an offering of the fruit from the ground. We read that in verse 3. We know that Abel brought an offering of the firstborn of his flock. And that we read in verse 4. Now, why was Cain's sacrifice not accepted? Because we clearly see in verses 4 and 5, uh, but David read that for us. So Cain's sacrifice was not accepted, that which he gave of the fruit of the ground. And what we must understand as we not just look only at Cain and Abel, but as we look all down through the Old Testament period right on into now, our time, is God has always, always, specified the way that he is to be worshipped. There's never been a period of man's existence upon this earth that man has been at liberty to worship God whatever way he pleases. God has always specified the way that he is to be worshipped. And this is quite contrary sometimes to many people's way of thinking. But yet, despite people's thinking, to the contrary, we can't worship God any way we want to and do whatever pleases us and then expect God to accept it. That we must clearly understand and come to terms with on an individual basis. In order for our worship to be acceptable, it must be pleasing to God. And what that means is according to the way that God has commanded. That's the only way we know if and when we're pleasing God. We know we're pleasing God when we're doing things according to what he's commanded. And God has revealed in his word the way that he wants us Christians in the New Testament to worship. We know that God revealed to Cain and Abel the way he desired to be worshipped. We know he did that. And how we know, though no specific mention is made of it in Genesis 4, we can know that God revealed his will in this matter to Cain and Abel because of what we read in Hebrews 11 and verse 4. Tim, read this that one. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gift, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. I notice that verse. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice. 
what it means when it says that Abel, by faith, offered it to God, it is that he offered to God the sacrifice of the firstborn of the flock because of that was what God commanded him. So by faith, not his own faith, not his own imagination, not his own impulses, and he attributes that to the way God wants it, but it's by faith. And what do we know about faith? How could Abel make an offering by faith? Well, Romans 10, 17. Why do you read this out? So then faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word of God. So if Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, it was because Abel heard what God said to do. And when he offered the first food of the flock, he was offering it by faith, because what God had told him to do is what Cain or what Abel was doing. That's what we must understand from, from Hebrews 11 and verse 4, as well as all of those characters that we read about there in Hebrews 11. The things they did by faith were the things they did according to the direction that God had given them. So, it's quite possible that Cain bought the best of the ground. In fact, I've heard that given as the reason why God did not accept Cain's offer. He didn't bring the best. That had nothing to do with it. Because truth in the matter is, he could have brought the best of the fruit of the ground. In fact, not only that, it, in all probability, was nowhere near being second rate. It could have been the absolute best. It could have been, like I said here, he might could have easily won a blue ribbon at the county fair with it. And it was probably beautiful food of the ground. It was probably delicious food of the ground. And most likely, here's another point. Most likely he was very sincere when he offered as a sacrifice this fruit of the ground. Probably we have no reason at all to question the sincerity that Cain had when he did this. But it was not the offering. It was not the kind of sacrifice that the Lord required. And we know that as we go on in our study of looking at things in the Old Testament as God commanded them. But here's a point. We need to be aware of the way of Cain. No chapters in Jude, but verse 11, but a white, what does it say? Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Woe to them, because they've gone in the way of Cain. What was the way of Cain? The way of Cain was to do what he did, not by faith. So, the way of Cain is to do things religiously. I mean, he didn't refuse to sacrifice. He didn't refuse to engage in a form of religion. He engaged in religion. But, let us understand that just simply doing things religiously is not necessarily by faith. And let us understand too that just being, re, you know, just being a religious act, as sacrificing was, didn't make him right 
And just because we may engage in what we consider a religious act does not of necessity make us right. It all has to come down to whether or not it is by faith, and that is the faith that comes with human, and human the word of God. So I ask, are there times when we know what God has required of us, but we do it our way? Are there entire, and they are, they are entire religious organizations where that's exactly the case. They feel, they feel that what they offer to God is good enough. After all, the idea is that just any kind of worship ought to be acceptable to God. Really? And, and that really the way that many people think? So, we must realize that when we do something in a religious way, we're only serving God when we do it according to what he has commanded. If it's not commanded by God, there's only other, one other alternative. If it's not a commandment of God, it's a commandment of man. And despite our sincerity, Jesus says, I worship his van. Got ahead of myself. Matthew 15 and 9, go to Pat. So remember, if it's not a commandment of God, it has to be a commandment of man. And if we're doing things that are not a commandment of God, we're doing things that are commandments of men. And Jesus plainly says that worship, however sincere that we engage in it, is vain. It's empty. And so in the Old Testament, we know that to worship meant a sacrifice of blood. That's why we know how it was that God had respect under Abel's sacrifice, but not under Cain, because Abel offered it by faith. Faith caused Abel to offer the first of the flock, which complies with what Hebrews 9 and verse 22 teaches, by the way. <laughs> I don't know, we've all heard that expression, you can't get blood out of a tongue. And I guess that was, in a sense, what King was thinking he was able to do, get blood from a tongue. So that's one lesson. God expects so be. Another lesson, God warns and offers a way of escape. In Genesis 4, I want us to go back and just look at that again. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you shall rule over it. I want to sort of paraphrase what we've just read in those two verses. Are you feeling bad about it? Why? If you do as I command, your countenance will be lifted up and you will be happy. But if you refuse to, then recognize that it is not me, your heavenly Father, nor is it able who is causing you to sin. But your refusal to do my will lays at your doorstep. It is your responsibility. You can rule over your evil desires. But if you do not, they will rule over you. I think that's 
as good of a paraphrase of what God has said to Cain in those two verses. It's a matter of our ruler over our evil desire, self-control. And that's what all disobedience comes down to. It's a matter that we have God's will on one hand, and it's not, it's not a matter that we don't know it. We know it. We know what God's will is. But it's a matter of exercising control over ourselves that will either cause us to obey or to disobey. And so what God is doing here is showing that Cain, there was a way for you to escape this. You be in control, or else, as I said, your evil desires will rule over you. And that's just as true today as it was when God spoke it to Cain. It's just as true for us today. Either we rule over our desires, or they will rule over us. But there's a way, there's that way of escape. We know from 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, Jeremy. No temptation has ever taken you except such as is common to man. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will also make the way of escape and you may be able to bear it. And I hope that's a very familiar verse to all of us. Temptation is common. We can't say that here is a temptation that is unique. I'm the only person in this world that's ever been tempted this way. No. No, it's the common lot of every human being. And in every temptation, temptation is not sin. Our Lord was tempted. But it's when we yield. It's when we no longer exercise that control that it will control us. If we exercise control, we will see and we will take that way of escape. But if we don't have self-control, we'll let that way of escape pass. And we'll be engaged in sin. And I know this is what God told Cain. And I know this is what the Holy Spirit is telling us today as Christians. But I, I found it interesting what God spoke to Jeremiah concerning the children of Israel. In Jeremiah 7, no temptation. Well, I duplicated the verse. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, turn with me to Jeremiah 7. I'm sorry. First mistake I've made this year. <laughs> Jeremiah 7, verses 5 through 7. Listen, listen to what he says. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, this is God bringing Israel back out of Babylonian captivity. If you thoroughly amend your ways, and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. See, it's a matter of control. That's what God is calling upon Cain that he should have done. This is what God is calling upon the children of Israel that he's now bringing out of 70 years of captivity. Here's what you need to do. You need to get in control. You need to amend your ways. You need to be thorough. I like the way those two words are used in those verses. Thoroughly amend your ways. Thoroughly execute judgment. Again, it's a matter of control. 
So God warns, and God offers a way of escape. A third lesson is that our deeds are outward expressions of our inward thoughts. And that we see in verse 8. Now when Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. See, the biggest problem with Cain's worship was that his heart was wrong. Notice what we see here, and going back to verse 4, the latter part of verse 4, the anger that he has against God. And now we see here in verse 8, the anger that he has against his brother. What causes anger? What causes hatred? You know, I really think to answer this question, we really don't have to go much further than just ourselves. Could it be envy that we have for someone for whatever the reason? Maybe it's their job that causes us to envy. Maybe it's their family the good family that they have that causes us to envy. Maybe it's something that they possess, some material possession. But whatever the case, could it be envy that we have for someone? You know, the Jewish leaders, they felt that way about Jesus. In fact, Pilate recognized it right off when they brought Jesus before, and he knew that it was for envy that they had brought him to. And not only did the Jewish leaders feel this way about Jesus, but think about Stephen. Think about Paul and many of those early Christians. And so it was with many today who can see nothing short of murder as a solution to the imagined problem. Now, we might draw the line here and say, somebody might say, well, you know, it wouldn't be possible for me to kill someone out of envy or jealousy. And I hope that's true. I hope you would never take literally a person's life. But let us not forget 1 John 3 and verse 15, Shane. So what this verse tells us is it's not necessary for us to carry out the execution for us to be just as guilty as Cain. And truly this is a lesson that we must learn from our study. The lesson four, we are (laughs) our brother's keeper. Remember that in verse nine, The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, we know what the answer to that is. And Cain knew too. We are our brother's keeper. We're to admonish one another. Romans 15 verse 14. Bobby, read that for us. We're to admonish him. We also are to share our material things with him. But at least read that first John chapter three, verse seventeen. But whoever has this world good and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart toward him, either the love of God abide in him. So that's a good question, isn't it? How does the love of God abide in? So we are to share a material thing. Two, we're our brother's keeper because we're not to do anything to cause them to stumble. And that word stumble we know means to make weak. It's the idea of causing a brother to sin. 
Matthew 18 and verse 6. Brother Glenn, read that for us. All right. So we're not to do anything to cause them to be either made weak or to sin. So we are our brother's keeper in that respect. And we are to restore those that have sinned. We've been Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So that question in Genesis 4, verse 9, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, we are. As Cain should have been. Had he been, the murder would not have been committed. A number five lesson, sin finds us out. In verse 10, he said, what have you done? This is God speaking. The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. In Numbers 32, verse 23. Uh, but Byman? You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your, your sin will find you out. And we know that. One minute. We know that. We know that our sins will find us out for the very simple reason that God is everywhere present. There's not a thing that is done. There's not even a thought in our minds that God does not know. So no sin can be hid. All things, the Bible says, are open and naked under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We're going to have to reckon. And that's, that's a lesson that every generation, every individual person needs to understand. And it, again, it goes back to the home. That's where it starts, is that we are responsible for our actions. And we will give an account for our actions. And the last lesson, lesson number six, is punishment does not mean repentance. And yet we know in verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. See, there's being sorry for our sins. And then there's being sorry that we got caught. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 9. Uh, Patrick. Now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry, sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. So there's two kinds of sorrow. We need to recognize them, and we need to be honest enough with ourselves that when we do sin, that we make sure which one of those sorrows that we possess. If we have a sorrow of this world, that includes being sorry that we got caught. I know of people that have sinned for years in their life until they got caught. They repented of it, but did they not realize they were sinning all those years? Now they're caught, now they repent. Could it be that their repentance is just a matter of the fact that they got caught. Otherwise, they would have been continuing in this sin. Well, that's, that's something that God will have to, to deal with in the day of judgment. But we need to be sure that when we sin, we have a godly sorrow. That's the sorrow that leads to true repentance. And that's the sorrow that's going to lead to the fruits of repentance that should come afterwards. Conclusion. 
Are we playing the part of Cain? You know, I'm sure we can see hundreds of ways that this lesson applies to our lives. So may each of us look deep within ourselves and purge out the weaknesses that motivated Cain and apply the principles of Abel to our lives. And then and only then, I think we can reap the benefits of what this story has been recorded for us all down through the ages. Any comments, any questions? Okay, Lord willing, next Wednesday evening we'll look at the third of our Old Testament character, and that is Enoch. And see what it is that we can learn either in a good way or a bad way from, from him. Appreciate so much the time together and for your attention.